Welcome back, friends. Welcome back, friends. So we had a very uh, superficial gloss, I know it was, over the modern scholarship. I thought the major work had been done between Mager and Fortescue, um, and then actually Dom Dix, the Anglican monk, he, he, he barred some light. But now we're in conclusion, exhortation, um, personal application mode. So what is all this? have to do with you and me and father sitting here today. I was in a recent conversation regarding two high school men, this high school age men, they were juniors or junior senior. One came from a, a divorced, um, nominally Catholic home, nominally. And the other one was from a good Catholic home, but by no means traditional. And both of those owned men out of their own volition sought out the Latin mass because they found something um, within their spirits that they were needing. And they found themselves really enjoying the Latin mass. And they started going back um, very, very often and, and they started bringing their friends along with them. And I found that very, this is mother of one of the young men telling me about this. And I found it interesting because it pointed to Dom Dix or pointed to, you know, the, the Didache or wherever that there's this deep human need to worship God and to worship him well. And I think it takes a great amount of theological study and cynicism to dampen that voice. Because it's so much a part of the human sphere. The early Christians gathered together to be accused to be accused of Christian. So Dix will make this point that to be accused of being a Christian, well, torture was a real useful that was standard uh, method in courts is to well let's torture them to see if that's true, and then you don't have too much way of countering that argument. So if your neighbor wanted your land, he'd make accusation that you're a Christian. You get tortured. Who knows what you're going to say under torture? Not much recourse. And yet the that desire to receive the Eucharist to be together in community. Mager states this. This is how he'll state this. Reason demands the worship of God, but it tells not the time place or ceremonial only divine revelation could determine these things um so we come back to dom dix's clear statement that changes in the shape of the liturgy directly and good or for bad affect society about the young men's uh experience tied into your recent scholarship of what you have found with the youth and um, the attraction of the Latin mass. Yes, there's there's a, a definitely a groundswell and I I, I connect I connected it with Peter because I know he was one of the principal intercessors in the early church and there's really no way his right could be as big as it is if it were just some sort of uh, hard stop or break between prior to 300 and after 300. The, it, it doesn't make sense that the church wouldn't have had a liturgy looking much like the liturgy we have today. Um, the church didn't wasn't interested in inventing new things. And in fact, after Vatican II, the Roman rite is the only one that changed. And that, to me, tells me that the demons are very upset by it, and, and they attacked specifically the Roman rite and no, none of the other rites, because that was, in my opinion, the, the rite of St. Peter. And if you, if you topple that, you've got 98% of the church going down. So when you use that phrase, Father, the Mass of St. Peter or the rite of St. Peter, 
what what is it that you how do you define that well well it's it's the the center of really rome was the center of the universe and the church used that to spread her apostolic uh outreach and so as the center of the church that was the central liturgy that was the liturgy that that, that bound all of us together of course we have the other lung I'd say it's a much smaller lung because the, the Eastern rites are only 2% of the church. But nonetheless, we have this monolith, this, this major heart that helps us stay unified as one church. And, and the Latin, that static language, as I've said so many times, keeps us reversing the curse of Babel. I know language changes. Um, I'm just ordering a Bible for <clears throat> a, a goddaughter's confirmation. ESV studied out of it at Augustine, and it, it's fine. But you need these when when it's in the vernacular. The language changes. What every forty years, fifty yes. years? It's just a, a constant. That's the nature of language. Absolutely. Yes, and you, you need you need that stabilizing force, you need that unity, and it, you know it really does. It, it it the the exorcists are starting to tell us more and more that that Latin language it provides unrest, it provides anger, it provides uh, befuddlement to the demons. They don't like it, uh, they hate it, and they don't they don't really uh, function well when they see our faithful going back to that center of, of unity and truth. Because again, the, the demons, not only do, not, do, do they not, not like Latin, they don't like uniformity. They'd like to be subversive. They like us to be separated. And it's not a, it's not a good thing that we speak different languages. That's a punishment. Yes, yes. We have a, we have a few more minutes. Would you have any, um words of exhortation for the people um, as they are on their Lenten journey or uh, t towards the Eucharist or anything else that the Lord may put on your heart? Yes, you know, I've said several times, and it's worth repeating, the, the liturgy isn't something for us to go in uh, expecting to get something out of it. The liturgy is us donating ourselves to God and showing him we're still trying to get that down payment. We're still trying to perfect ourselves. And, and so we don't go into it slavishly following it either. In the classic model, the, the faithful would have come into the church without pews, and they would have been doing devotions. They would have been doing Stations of the Cross. They would have been kneeling in front of St. Joseph if that, they had a devotion to him. They would have been saying the rosary. They would have been doing all sorts of things or even discussing theology quietly among themselves. And then when the bells rang, that was time to focus on the altar. That was time to know that you were in eternity. When that first bell rang at the epiclesis and really that first turn at the at the offertory, that's the opening of the eternal, uh, the eternal window to us. And then it closes again as the priest makes that final turn at the at the final blessing. So that is when you focus on the altar. That is when you really try to get deeply into prayer. Before that, they were mulling around everywhere in the church. They were all over the place, um, showing their devotion and their love. And any type of prayer, any type of prayer was unified with what the priest was doing. The priest was going to God and from God on behalf of the people. And the people understood that. I think a lot of times people think it's what they have to, you know, what they're doing. You know, it's what, what you're giving to God. That's the important part. I had a, um, a mother, came, she came to the Latin Mass um, after, I think they have, they have quite a large family. In any event, she, she realized the priest can offer the Mass and she can offer... Um, uh, her children, her relationships, right? She can offer that which is going on, her own personal prayers that she just said, and the priest can offer it because there was a silence that there was this moment. And she felt so very free. 
and as opposed to, oh, I've got to be off saying this and doing that, doing this. And there would be a tension. She felt much uh, greater peace and unity, a unification with what was the sacrifice. That's right. That's and right. You know, during a daily mass, you can come anytime you want during the mass. It's not not obligatory. Now it's it's all it's laudatory to be there from the very beginning, but you know Sunday mass, you know strictly speaking, you have to be there for the gospel. Um, it's not not good to keep showing up late and you know in time for the gospel, but that's strictly your obligation. And we should realize that the beauty of the mass is that. Um, sometimes we're, we're late because of traffic or, or, or what have you, but especially during Lent, you hear this Benedict Camus Domino in the pre-55. That's because Ite Misa Est was go out, you know, get get going, get your apost get your apostolate going. The Benedict Camus Domino in, in the, 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 the violet seasons is trying to encourage people to stay at Mass and offer their thanksgiving. So it's not saying go out. It's saying, blessed be God. Let's continue the praise. Let's stay in church for a little bit longer and show God how, how thankful we are for him. That's wonderful. Wonderful. All right, my friends. There's a little bit of food for thought there on uh, what, what did Jesus do? What did Peter do? Um, again, we thank Father for being here, I'll, and I will ask him if he would be so kind to give us all a blessing. Okay, very good. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. We ask Almighty God to bring his benevolence, his omnipotence upon all of us, and to keep us on the way that leads to heaven and off of the broad way that leads to perdition. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti, De Shedesu Gurvos et Manit Semper. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Till the next time, my friends. Fides et ratio.